Today on the John Ankerberg Show, the world watches as Russia exerts its power in the Middle East, as Iran continues to threaten Israel, as Jewish people continue to flee Europe, as the European Union struggles with Islamic terrorism inside its borders, and as the world faces increasing Islamic terror attacks worldwide. The God of the Bible has given us biblical prophecy of end time events. How do the nations and events that we are seeing today relate to what the Bible says will happen in the last days? My guest who will answer these questions is news journalist and prophecy scholar, Dr. Jimmy DeYoung, who has lived and reported from Jerusalem since 1991. He has interviewed every Israeli prime minister over the last 25 years and foreign leaders such as King Abdullah of Jordan and the late Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. We invite you to join us. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg. Thanks for joining me today. My guest is news journalist Dr. Jimmy DeYoung, who lives many months of every year in Jerusalem. And this goes all the way back to 1991. And during these years, he's interviewed every Israeli prime minister. He has interviewed people in the military, left and right. He's interviewed members of the Knesset as they've come and gone. He's interviewed even foreign dignitaries, such as the late Yasser Arafat, as well as King Abdullah of Jordan. And so I'm glad that he's here today. And we're talking with Jimmy about what's happening in Israel and in the Middle East. And then we're comparing that with his knowledge of biblical prophecy. And we're talking about three major prophecies, the overarching prophecies of Jesus saying that he's coming back and he's going to rapture or take off of the earth all the Christians that are all over the earth and he's going to do it in a single moment. And only unbelievers are going to be left. And then during the next period of seven years, there's going to be a tribulation time of judgment, wars that are going to come on, the Antichrist, all of these things, and Jimmy will talk about that a little bit more, followed at the end by the Battle of Armageddon, and then we have the second coming of Jesus Christ where he's going to come and rule and reign. So prophecy revolves around Jesus Christ. And underneath those, we've been talking about a specific prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38, where the prophet Ezekiel talked about and prophesied there's going to be a coalition of nations that are going to come together and they're going to come against Israel. We've been talking about who they are, and I'm going to ask Jimmy to summarize that for us. And then one other thing, underneath all of that, we're looking at five stunning events that have taken place since Jimmy was with us one year ago. And they are the rise of Russian power in the Middle East, the nuclear deal that America made with Iran overlooking Israel's objections and those of the other nations in the Middle East, the number of Jewish people who have left Europe. We're down to about just a million people only in Europe. What's happening? There's something behind that. The change that is going on in Europe where it's becoming a superpower and grappling with the rise of Islam inside its borders. And then, of course, the rise of Islamic terrorism worldwide. How do these events that we're talking about fit in with the big picture of where Bible prophecy says history is going? And you've got these pillars up here. I want to start with the major prophecies, go to Ezekiel, and then we want to conclude with how do these world events fit into it? And finally, is America in end time events? Is Europe in end time events? So a lot to cover. Let's start with the major overarching prophecies. Folks, you have the columns in front of you on the screen. The column on the left hand side of your screen would be referred to, as John already mentioned, the rapture. And that's when Jesus was talking about in the upper room with his disciples the evening before he was crucified the next day. And he was trying to help the people that he had been teaching for three and a half years understand the moment. He said, don't be worried at this point. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go, I shall come again and receive you unto myself. Now that's not the return of the Lord to the earth. He's going to catch us up to be with him in the air. 
Apostle Paul talks about it, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. John the Revelator illustrates it in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, because in verse 1 he's on the earth, and verse 2 he's located in the third heaven, so he is translated at the sound of a trumpet. So that's the rapture. And then from chapter 4, verse 2 of Revelation through chapter 19, verse 10, we see 16 chapters of detailed information about the tribulation period. On previous programs, we've talked about the prophecy and more in depth on the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, bringing into the thinking as well to the table of our discussion, Psalm 83 and Daniel chapter 11. That coalition of nations in the first six months of that tribulation period, that seven-year period of time, is going to unfold when they try to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. The book of Psalm chapter 83 and verse 4 says they go into a council meeting. They come out of that meeting. They say, let's get rid of Israel. Wipe them off the earth that her name be forgotten forever. That's exactly the driving desire of all of these nations listed in the coalition, which will be headed up by Russia. At the midway point, we talked in a previous program about the temple on the Temple Mount. It'll be there at the midway point. John wrote chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 about that temple on the Temple Mount. Jesus confirmed it. Daniel gave us the information back in his prophecy, Daniel 9, 27. At the conclusion of that seven-year period of time, all the nations of the world gathered together, and I like the term the campaign of Armageddon because it doesn't happen in the battlefield there in the Jezreel Valley at the beginning. All the nations of the world gather there in the city of Jerusalem, and then Jesus steps out of the heavenlies back onto the earth there on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives splits, making way for all of these gathered in Jerusalem to go to the Valley of the Mountains. Now that's the Jezreel Valley. That Jezreel Valley, 14 miles wide, 67 miles long, 1,000 square miles, is surrounded by mountain ranges. They're going to go up there, and when Jesus finishes building the temple in Jerusalem, he goes up to the battlefield and just pronounces them dead, and then ultimately after going to Petra to gather his people, the Jewish people he protected during that last terrible time of judgment in the tribulation he brings into Jerusalem, and they go into the temple. This is a part of the second coming activities the Lord God Himself gives Jesus Christ His kingdom a thousand-year period of time after the second coming. So that lays out an end-time scenario. And if you'll just focus in your mind on the rapture, the tribulation period, the second coming of Christ, it'll give you an idea. It'll give you basically a roadmap through end-time events that you can hang all of these prophecies on. Yeah, and in terms of understanding world events that are taking place today, one of the things that I think will help people is if they understand the nations that God says in Ezekiel 38 are going to come together and form a coalition during the tribulation time period and come against Israel. Quickly summarize what Ezekiel prophesied is going to take place in the end times. Well, Ezekiel said that Magog, and that would go back to Genesis 10, that's going to be Russia, one of the sons of uh, Jepheth and the grandson of Noah. He went north of the Black Sea, established a, a nation there because in 4,500 years ago in Genesis 10, that's when nations were established. So he went to Russia, which included the Ukraine, and there he established that nation. As you continue to read through the passage of Ezekiel 38, you see Magog, then you see Meshach and Tubal in verse 2 as well. You see in verse 6, Gomer and Tagarma, that would be modern day Turkey. In verse 5 of chapter 38 of Ezekiel, you see Persia. That's modern day Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran. You see Cush. That would be Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan. You see Put. That would be modern day Libya. You add to that then the nations mentioned over in Psalm 83 and verse 6 is talking about the Ishmaelites. That's Saudi Arabia. And verse 7 is talking about Tyre. That's modern day Lebanon. You go to Daniel chapter 11, John. In verses 40 through 43, you see the king of the north and the king of the south. Early on in chapter 11, king of the north is defined as the geographical location of Syria, king of the south, geographical location of Egypt. 
All right, so you've got this biblical prophecy that is on the table that God said is going to happen and it's coming up. And you say, how close are we? And Jimmy, I want you to comment on how these biblical prophecies pertain to the very world events that we've been talking about through these programs. And first, let's take the rise of Russian power in the Middle East. It has rapidly expanded. It's incredible. Its ties in Syria, its ties with Iran and other places in the Middle East, how this has happened. Apply this to biblical prophecy. After the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the demise of communism, Vladimir Putin started to play a key role in the leadership of Russia. He was the president for a number of years, stepped aside, made his prime minister the president, and Putin became the prime minister for a four-year period of time, changed the constitution so they could expand the length of time a man could serve as president, and Putin ran and became president of Russia. He's going to serve a six-year period of time. He'll have an opportunity for a run for re-election if he's not named the czar before those elections actually come about. And so he has control of this area called Russia. Russia is key to the entire world. Look at Europe, for example. When Vladimir Putin took over Crimea, there wasn't a shot fired, nobody really complained. And so he has a connection to the European Union. This is a part of his rise to power. He's forcing the people in the Ukraine to give him the land bridge to bring his materials, his munitions and everything else over to Crimea, that warm water port, so he can get to the waterways of the world. During that same period of time, he moved in to prop up Bashar Assad, who's in Syria. Now, there has been a long civil war going on. A quarter of a million of the Syrian people have been killed. And here comes Russia. They had been playing a little insignificant role. They did have a port there on the Mediterranean coast of Syria. They had bring some ships in uh, just for temporary duty for their military in the Navy there. But then they decided to jump in full force and stand beside Bashar Assad. They started to bring their boots on the ground, their military personnel into Syria. At one time, they only had 30,000. I think that number is up close to almost 100,000 of those personnel from Russia who are now in that part of the world there in Syria at a key location geographically for the entire Middle East. They have a relationship with Iran. When you look at Iran, uh, Iran started developing a nuclear weapon of mass destruction when they got the technology and help from the technicians to do that from Russia. And so there's a relationship there. They formed a partnership there in Syria. Iran has come in with their Revolutionary Guard. Now the skies over, the airspace over Syria is controlled by Russia mainly, but also the Iranians as well. Vladimir Putin put S-400s after the Turkish Air Force took out one of those Russian jet fighters. Then Vladimir Putin said, we mean business in the Middle East. We're going to protect ourselves. He put the S-400. That's a ground-to-air missile that takes out any type of whatever is in the air, any type of aircraft, any type of missile that may be an attack weapon of some type on your forces. And so he's major there in the Middle East as well as in Europe, and this is how he's coming quickly to power. He has a desire to control the world, and when you have the rest of the world's leaders stepping aside, letting him do carte blanche, basically what he wants to do, especially in the Middle East, he's going to take advantage of it. Talk about the nuclear deal America made with Iran. From the perspective of when you're in Jerusalem and this deal was made, what was the feeling and how has this affected the nations in the Middle East and how does this apply to biblical prophecy? Of course, everybody knows that Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, was livid when the United States talked about and then moved to make that agreement with Iran. I say the United States. The other players at the table there in that discussion to put that nuclear agreement together, they really were simply 
wallpaper as it relates to what was going on. It was the Secretary of State, John Kerry, who put the thing together with the Foreign Minister of Iran, and they came together. This was a plan that the President of Iran, Rouhani, had put in place a number of years ago. It was to negotiate, delay, and continue to develop the nuclear weapon of mass destruction. Every single day during eight years of the presidency of Ahmadinejad, he said, we're going to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. The Ayatollah Ali Khomeini said, we can do it in nine minutes. We have Shahab three missiles. We'll put a nuclear warhead on that Shahab. We can target any location in Israel. And Netanyahu was very much concerned about that. I personally talked with Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel. I said, sir, what will you do? What will cause you to give the order for that preemptive strike? He says, when my intel, intelligence community of Israel, tells me that they're mounting one of those nuclear warheads on one of those Shahab missiles, I will give the attack warning and order to go ahead and go after them. And whether the United States steps up, whether the European Union steps up, this is a matter of life and death as far as we're concerned. We'll deal with that situation. Let's talk about the change that is happening in Europe. They're rising to superpower status. And at the same time, they are trying to struggle with this rise of Islamic terrorism inside their midst. But how does that play into biblical prophecy? Well, the book of Daniel, go back to Daniel chapter 7, three main books that look at the end times. All of God's Word is profitable and important for us to study. But the three main prophetic books would be Daniel, Ezekiel, and Revelation. We've talked about all of them on these programs. The book of Daniel chapter 7 says the Roman Empire, chapter 7 and verse 7, has ten horns on it. Now that's a prophetic passage. The Roman Empire was in place at the times of Jesus Christ, not necessarily with the ten horns. The ten horns are defined in Daniel chapter 7, verses 23 and 24, as a group of leaders from the old Roman Empire who come to power, and they're going to select one of those leaders to be the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8, who rises to power among those ten, and he becomes the world dictator. People know him by many names from the scriptures, but most familiar, the Antichrist. He's going to come to power in the old revived Roman Empire coming into place, and we see Rome as the location, the center of not only a religious operation, a false religiosity, but the headquarters for those ten horns of Daniel chapter 7 there in chapter 17 of Revelation and verse 12, those ten horns come to power one hour with the beast, which is that Antichrist. It is true that Europe is becoming a major political power in our world. They're dealing with issues that fit into the end time scenario of God's Word i.e. the Ukraine, with Russia one in the Ukraine, with the European Union one in the Ukraine. The Ukraine was a part of the old Roman Empire, but it was also the part of the beginnings of what we know as Russia today. That was a part of Russia early on in the establishment of that particular nation. You had to add all of these things together to understand how Europe is key and the rise of a superpower a world leader, the Antichrist, coming out of that world. Quickly talk about the fact of ISIS is actually bragging about the fact that their goal of world subjugation could come about. They are actively involved in almost every country around the world. And we've got incidents in the news all the time. How does this play in, the rise of Islamic terrorism, into the prophecy picture? Well, Islamic terrorism is rampant across the world, and that's almost a bit separate from Islamic State itself. There's Islamic terroristic activities happening everywhere you want to go. It's not all the responsibility of Islamic State. But the phenomenon about Islamic State is that they've come to power in a region of the world. I'm talking about Syria and Iraq, ISIS, ISIS which is the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. That's what that acronym stands for. They control 50% of 
all the land mass of Syria. They control many of the major cities. They're headed over to Baghdad in Iraq. Ultimately, they want to go to Babylon. When you go to Revelation chapter 18, it talks about Babylon being the center of a worldwide dominion where the Antichrist will be. Islamic State has that vision in mind, albeit Scripture tells us they will never get to that point, but that's their desire. They now have connection to Hamas, which is located in the Gaza Strip, who wants to take out Israel. They're in the Sinai Desert. They're training people. They're bringing young people out of Europe, out of the United States, bringing them to the training ground of Syria, helping them to develop readiness to be able to go back to their own countries, their own regions, and bring about terroristic activities to bring everybody in this world under the control of Islam in a caliphate that is going to be set up. What about America? Do you see America in biblical end time events? You know, that's the most asked question in any Bible prophecy time that I ever have. Where's the America in the United States? An old guy tried to answer that question one night for me and he said, well, it's uh, in Jerusalem. I said, what? He said, oh yeah, J-E-R-U-S-A-L-E-M. You know, he was being a bit funny, but that's true. The only place I see America even referred to would be Jerusalem. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 2, where it says, At the end of that seven-year tribulation period, all the nations of the world gather at Jerusalem. Now, why is that going to be the case? If America is still around at that time, they'll be there. But why aren't they a superpower? The rapture of the church takes place, the backbone of this nation, the Christian is taken out of it. And the fact is that this nation on the slippery slope to moral decay, educational decay, military decay, economic decay is going down. You take the backbone out, America becomes a nebulous entity. If they are around after a seven year period of time, they'll be at Jerusalem. We're seeing all of these events. How close to the rapture are we? How close to the tribulation are we and to this war of Ezekiel 38? Every single prophecy, John, that we've talked about, Ezekiel chapter 38, the coalition of nations, the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the spread of Islamic radicalism, Islamic State, the rise of Russia to power, what's going on in Europe. Every one of the prophecies we've discussed on these programs will happen after the rapture of the church. And what we've talked about in these days together seems to indicate that rapture could happen at any moment. In fact, I think before the program is even over. Now, if it doesn't, it's going to happen afterwards, but it could happen at any moment. And when it does, God knows those who belong to him. And those that don't belong to him are going to be left to go into that tribulation yes. time period. The people that realize they're in that latter group here, what should they do? The first thing they must do is admit they are a sinner. God set the standard. They cannot keep it. I couldn't keep it. You couldn't keep it. But the Lord so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whomsoever would believe in him shall be saved. Believe that he came, gave his life, on a cross, rose from the dead after that, guaranteeing he was the one who can give eternal life and call upon him. Trust in him to give them eternal life. And the urgency of the moment with all that we see unfolding is that they must do that very soon now. And folks, if you haven't done that, I would urge you, urge you to do it right now. Just pray and ask the Lord to come into your life. Put your trust in what he did for you and wants to give you as a gift. He's the one that'll come in and change you. You cannot change yourself. He does the changing, but you need to come into a relationship with him. And that starts when you put your faith in Christ. Jimmy, I wanna say thank you for all of the information that you've shared in these programs. You always amaze me with all the knowledge and the experience that you've had dealing with folks in the Middle East and the knowledge that you have of the Bible. And folks, if you, would like to have all of this material, just stay tuned and we'll tell you how to get it right now. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program.